Okay. But the format of this is that we will be discussing in depth some, the, what happened in the panels the previous day. Okay. Uh, so we did this uh, yesterday, we did it similarly. All right. So we'll have Swapna. Uh, so we'll be discussing uh, possibly two topics. Now, these are topics selected from the panels and the topics that we felt, the three of us who are organizing this, felt would be useful for discussion in this format. And the, what is the format? Format is really peer-to-peer -peer learning, okay? It is where you will, it's not just asking questions, you will give your opinions. And it really doesn't matter what level person you are or anything, it really doesn't matter. You know something that others need to hear, be very bold about this because it's a very informal, nobody is taking notes, nobody is taking, keeping count. Uh, uh, and uh, yesterday it worked out really well. People were very eloquent uh, in actually saying. And the other thing that you can do in this format is you can respectfully challenge somebody's statement, okay? In fact, it's more fun if you do, all right? So, so I'll, now I'll get Swapna to explain the, the first uh, topic, and then I will continue with moderating the session. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, so today, moderator is a new moderator. And today, Vikram passed the mo moderator mic on to me and Himanshu. So today is the last day of our Energy Summit. So in this uh, last day, in this, the previous two days, I think you guys heard a lot of keywords like uh, like zero, uh, net zero CO2 emission, s solar PV, and uh, what else? Energy storage, hydrogen energy, all these things you have uh, heard in these things. So it's uh, coming, all this coming from all renewable, non-renewable power stores. So it is, and yesterday there was a panel about renewable energy and its uh, energy storages. So there was, a, uh, there was a question raised by the moderator of the panel, uh, Aaron, that is this solar and wind, uh, we are, a lot of research and development are going on right now, and there are a lot of presentations also or talk, is this solar and uh, wind energy enough to, for the energy demand, to fulfill the energy demand of the society? And is there any third uh, renewable energy required for that? And what we thought that the question is very present state of the art, like in the present scenario, it's very important because recently last month, our Honorable Prime Minister has uh, pledged that, uh, promised that in a climate change conference that by 2030, we will like, increase the non-fossil fuel capacity to 500 gigawatts, where 50% of that energy requirement will be coming from renewable energy. Now the question is that, will we depend on solar and wind, or we need a third or fourth uh, renewable energy? So this is the topic of discussion, and I would like to active participation of all the participants. Thank you. Rajneesh, you want to talk? So yeah, already we are doing biomass, so that's another renewable energy. We have, uh, but then there are other challenges with biomass which we can talk about, discuss today. Uh, if you are uh, not bothered about nuclear, then nuclear is another energy which uh, basically we certainly need in India. Uh, other bio, uh, renewable energies we are using, uh, uh, hydroelectricity is again a form of renewable energy. Tidal is something which we can certainly do a bit. I don't see any other... Uh, so that's some of the points. Probably I'll expect others to now start discussing each of these one by one. So Geothermal, yeah, I'm not too sure about it. It's whether uh, we have, uh, yeah, but then it's uh, very close to Vikram. So I will give him uh, uh, an opportunity to talk about geothermal a bit more today. So Rajneesh mentioned all the renewable energy, possible biomass, geothermal, nuclear, tidal, ocean is left. So what are the, anything else? What to add, Satya? There's a lot of ocean heat and we know global warming is going to give you more heat in the ocean. So I think that's a great source. But my, my question is to really say, do we need all so much renewable? Can we somehow figure out endlessly recycling carbon? Yeah, I mean, people are talking about recycling carbon, putting it back into the use and re 
from a system perspective. You have base load, you have carbon creation. Figure out a way to endlessly recycle carbon. So why do we, why, and why are we so fixated on solar, wind, and other kinds of sources? So what do you call as uh, less dense sources? Anybody would like to defend or against of that? Rajneesh? Coming to you. Recycle of carbon. Talking about renewable energy. Nobody talked about energy utilization. We, we can save a lot of energy by proper utilization. Which are normally, uh, yesterday I was expecting some, um, some talk about that, but it did not happen. Okay, so that you are. We are energy utilization is a sector where we can save quite a lot of energy. We are talking about re renewable energy. We are not talking about utilization part. Utilization of the energy yeah. coming from the fossil fuel. For example, lamps uh, come down to LED. LED power be saved. And so, so many, there are so many sectors, BLDC motor, so many sectors we can save energy. Instead of generating energy only, saving energy uh, is another important point. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. To save energy, any, anybody wants to comment on that? The mode in renewable energy development, maybe we are more con should concentrate on this how to save energy. Industrial waste heat is probably the way to start, where there is a clear payback for them. I think Satya is very close to that. So these guys are doing some work. That's the way to start for energy efficiency, at least in industries. It's a state. Right now, I think with mechanisms which can also capture low grade, low temperature heat and convert it. And I keep hearing a lot about Stirling engines and all. I don't know how much they have progressed. So maybe Satya and others can expand on it. Can we really capture a lot of this uh, low temperature heat as well as medium high temperature heat? What is the status now? How much of the potential has been realized? And how much can be realized in the short term? So the question is, can we do it? The answer is yes. Can we do it economically? Maybe. Are we doing it economically? No. So it's really a question of, again, where solar was. So it's not only a technology question. There is a lot of incentives. There is a lot of policy. There is a lot of commercialization comes up. So uh, this, is, this can be said about almost all technologies that's gone through it, right? Solar, energy storage, and all of that. So uh, there are a variety of technologies. Not everyone is going to win out. So I, I really don't know. But definitely technology exists. Uh, you guys have been working on this. And you're close to thermodynamics. And Mama and quite a few other guys are doing work. You guys should be knowing the answer, why it's not become economical. It looks like fairly close to... And I so I'll, I'll simply put this times. answer. What is the price of CO2 right now that you are putting out in the air? It is relevant. So for make... See, see, the nature has made coal millions of... You are burning dead dinosaurs. That's so cheap. Everything else is expensive. So unless and until you put a tax on the CO2 because of burning dead dinosaurs, you're not going to make anything else attractive. Okay, I think you have a point to make. Oh, this is the same. Okay. Yeah. Let me uh, suggest something. Let's move into another area rather than reco waste recovery. There are at least two areas which we well understand that, have, uh, that are in the area of doing the same work for less energy. All right. So one, and you heard Professor Jinjimala yesterday and others, is DC architecture. Any DC, most DC devices, a DC fan, a DC compressor, uh, are 70 to 85 percent more efficient than AC device of the same uh, utility, shall we call it. All right. So going to DC architecture is going to have a tremendous reduction. I mean, you, those of you who saw uh, Ashok speak yesterday, he mentioned his own personal experience and all that. Okay. So let's take that bucket and let's talk about that. Why not DC? The other bucket that I'd like you to consider is electric vehicles. Most people think electric vehicles are because of zero tailpipe emissions. True. But the main reason for electric vehicles is it's 65% more efficient than an IC engine mined to wheel, you know, from the life cycle analysis. I'm going to feed, feed those two things to you, and let's take the conversation. Oh, you got your own. Daisy, utilization is okay. But I feel 
uh, DC cannot be transmitted. Transmission process will be very, it's not possible to transmit DC as utilization at the house level uh, is fine. But uh, you must bring the energy up to the house on the AC form, then there you can convert. Okay, is he right? Can somebody challenge him? He's saying DC cannot be transmitted easily. Okay, correct. So, is, no, it, is no, low voltage no. DC? Okay. Uh, so, can somebody challenge that assertion? Anybody? If we don't, then I'm going to have to, and moderators don't lose to. Ah, very good, very good. Yeah, there you go. So, I think uh, so, w there are two things here. Like, we have been always accustomed to saying that DC Can you come to the table here to people yeah, see you? Yeah, let me also grab yeah. coffee. Sorry. <laughs> so I think we have been always accustomed to saying that DC transportation is very difficult. I mean, transporting the DC current uh, or DC power. But the thing is that it's been happening everywhere. I think, the, and, and, the, and since in the India, actually, in India. in India, it's happening in India. It's happening at IIT Madras. I think it's just that we have not done it at a very large scale to really come out with the overall energy losses. Uh, compared to the AC. Yesterday we talked about transmission and distribution losses. I think together if you uh, calculate that both transmission and then the distribution losses, I think we may end up at the same number as AC. And the other thing is that we are talking about distributed energy sources, wind and sun, solar energy. I think we, and both of them, uh, sorry, sorry, wind will give AC, that's fantastic, but solar will give only DC power at the end of the day. And we have to utilize it directly if we try to keep converting them to AC again and again. The losses we may encounter in the converge, conversion will be much higher than the loss due to the transmission. So the two points he made, and let's build on those two points. One point he made was uh, DC transmission is happening. By the way, by the way, it's called high voltage DC. It is happening uh, in India and elsewhere. The other point he made is very interesting. He said on distributed power, when you have the power in a village or something, then the distances are short. And had the distance, that been the case, even Edison would have won, the, won, the, won that fight, okay, with, with Tesla. So, to, to, w would you general, okay, so let's build on that point. The long distance transmission versus short distance transmission. Anybody? Come on, guys. This has got to be easier than this. Long transmission is okay, DC, but short transmission is not economical. What is not economical? But it's because every time you convert a DC to AC, you, 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 um, there are two, two, three factors. One is most of the equipments which are installed here are AC. Converting directly to DC is not very difficult, very costly. Okay, somebody so, challenge that statement, please, because if you don't, then I will. But no, but yeah. I think except some major induction loads, motors and all, most of the loads in the house are now DC. That's not... Could most of the loads expand on that point. See, you look at your ACs. Now you're calling inverter air conditioners, inverter refrigerators, LED lights. Okay. Almost all our LED tube, everything is a DC load. Okay, can, we're can, just used to the AC wiring at home. That's all. Can I ask you one question? Sure. So, suppose we, have, we feel like replacing all the ACs in IIT campus. Is it possible? It is possible. No, it is possible, but now what is the cost? Cost. cost see, there see, is no. I am. I will. I agree with it you. It is possible. For the, for I the can. New, new installations. I agree with you. But not for the old installation. It is impossible. It is possible. No. It is. No. It no, is no, no. 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 I think it is an economy of scale. The cost. It is just an economy. Economy, economy is very important. I, I, I tell you. How did LED light became so cheap? See, LED. No. For the new right, installation. Same problem, I, right? Five built, years ago, LED. When I built a new house, I. Switch out LDD. That I agree with you. No, no, I'm asking no, about I'm the cost. About replacing the old one. It's difficult. No, no, no. I'm asking, yeah, you're talking about cost. I'm saying LED was 1,000 rupees a bulb. It came down to 70 rupees a bulb. How did it happen? Scale. So we really need somebody to say, put in my mind and scale. Uh, actually, I'm not supporting. Uh, I'm, I'm supporting. No, no, I'm just responding to your point that DC is not viable. I think DC is viable. We have to really look at it, look at ways to see if it makes sense. That's all. Okay. Folks, time out on this topic for the moment, or this this segment of the topic. Uh, Himanshu has an opinion on how to go with Yeah, Next. I think we have discussed a lot about electric since the last two days. This is an energy summit, not electric energy summit. So let's uh, diversify a little bit and talk about some other sources of energy as Rajneesh was initially starting to mention biomass and geothermal, tidal. Can somebody share his or her opinion on any of the alternate sources of energy apart from solar and wind? No electricity. I was going to... 
sorry, hello, can you hear me? Yes. No, I was going to just branch out and talk about battery versus capacitor, but you're, you're like, <laughs> want to... Sorry, wrong uh, timing. Uh, wrong timing, sorry. <laughs> don't want to take time so, Himanshu, can I? Yeah, sure. Right. So, this is going to be a very fundamental and fun, fun thing now. No, no solar from my side today and hydrogen also. And uh, so typically after our group meetings on Saturdays, we go out for coffee and we do, my, with my students, we do discuss a lot of new energy sources. And we have been seen to sun, wind, tidal, geothermal, all these things. And then we discuss like, we have this lot of energy wasted through lightning, a lot of energy during the, uh, from the clouds. And uh, one of my students gave a name, Holy Grail Energy Source, uh, for the energy in the clouds. You know, we have been even uh, uh, planning to build a portable Van de Graaff generator in the lab to simulate the lightning and try to harvest in uh, the energy in the supercapacitors. Coming to electric, but that's it. Now I'm not going to talk more about it. So I think we've been so far like talking more about what is in the newspapers. And we have, someone also discussed, like, most of the Western countries try to project something, and then we blindly follow that thinking. The, the, the reason is there's also too much of data into that. That's why we try to follow. Now I'm saying that there are places which are cloudy all the time, and clouds are completely charged. C can I store that energy? And only there is a dielectric breakdown between earth and cloud, it, it, the lightning is formed, and it's like several tens of thousands of kilovolt, right? So I think India needs to look into those options too, even if Western countries doesn't like it or not explode it. I, I feel, I'm sure many of you have thought about something of this sort, and uh, we hope at IIT Madras we will have uh, the first uh, cloud and lightning simulator with the energy storage device. Thank you, Arvind. You carefully again brought back the topic to electricity here. <laughs> but it's a very interesting uh, topic. I never uh, knew about it that we can also try to harvest energy from clouds. Anybody uh, has any idea about harvesting energy from clouds? If not, we can go back to, uh, again, our traditional sources of renewable energy we have heard about. Traditional renewable energy sources we have heard about. Hello? If we don't know about clouds. Sir. Yes. So uh, I would like to know a uh, uh, few questions about ocean energy. Europe, there are uh, thousands of projects they have deployed. Now uh, the phase is commercially keen, but India not yet, there is single project yet now. But I, I would like to know uh, what are the reasons why still it is, even I have never seen any registered company in India. Uh, in US, Canada, uh, Sweden, um, UK, there are a lot of projects they are doing. Uh, but I would like to know why still India is lagging in that area, ocean, especially ocean with tidal or wave energy, both. So can somebody pick up on that? I don't know enough about it to really speak, but I will if nobody does. Satya. Ocean. Ocean energy. Well, ocean means, he means tidal, wave, all See, of those. See, I'll give you a statistic, right? Uh, the bay just off India, the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Bay, uh, contains 180 gigawatts, base load potential, just from the surface to one kilometer deep. Technologies exist for people to mine the heat. It goes back to the same thing that I talk about, how will you foot the bill for it, but it's base load, clear energy, you don't need anything. Just off the coast of all of India, the wave crest potential is about uh, 15 to 25 kilowatt per meter of wave. And you know how much of a coastline we have. We have almost a 7,500 kilometer long coastline. A plant load factor. I mean, these are all base load kind of systems. So does it does exist. It really depends on policy that drives some of these things. If you ask me, do we have technology? Uh, recently, Yamanari announced that uh, uh, ocean energy is also a renewable energy. It is renewable, but Yamanari announcement is not sufficient. I mean, they will give you one crore, two crore project with which you can't do anything. Uh, but even 1990s, they have started in Willingham project, right? But now it was 30 years nearly, still not yet resources has problem, been done. Right. Who pays for the electricity? Initially, it's going to be expensive. Then solar came out, solar electricity. But why in Europe, rupees, right? Europe, Canada, Sweden, those are all the countries are possible. No, that's in why, Portugal, even that's why you can't take energy as a technology problem. Energy is a geopolitical, socio-economic, at last a technology problem. Why uh, sea waves can't uh, rotate the turbine? Uh, we can't be able to uh, design that kind of turbine. Can. I, we can. Why? So as I, uh, I'll interrupt, so as I mentioned, so Satya, what, what Satya is trying to say, we have technology, it is also economical probably, 
but because of the policy and the government uh, push is not there. Oh, that's why I am mentioning again. Yeah, so MNRI announced 2019 it, itself. But policy is, they are supporting, right? You know, MNRI, before MNRI it was MNES, before it was unconventional energy, they have been announcing programs for 30 years. It has to be a combination of market-driven policies. These are all exploratory policies. Market-driven policies with supportive industries, with supportive consumers, that has to drive it. Recently, I have seen a few articles about NIOT and IIT Madras collaborating with, uh, uh, they have designed some turbine kind of. Uh, early so status. what is the early status, status of that? Yesterday, uh, I think Nikhil spoke something about commercial readiness level. So what we have technology is at a higher technology readiness level, but many of these are very low on commercial readiness level, which means it will take some time to uh, so, I mean, talking about the commercial readiness level, right? So, one of the challenge with ocean energy has been, we know how to convert it, but when we think of doing it in an economic way, that's one challenge. That's a barrier. And the other is that energy is, yes, we have a large coastline. How to get it where we want it? So, we need a good grid and a place where we can get it all together, which is a challenge for a large country. It can be done in Scandinavian countries more easily than here. So I think the techno-economic analysis, and others have also mentioned, is where the barrier lies to my knowledge, right? Maybe I can add on that is Scotland. Yeah, Scotland is pretty big on wave energy because obviously poor guys, they don't have the sun and, uh, you know, rain all the time. But wave energy, there is a huge amount of research and there are enough actually pilot generating stations out in Scotland all across the, the East Coast. Okay, and they're also doing some work on the West Coast uh, because North Sea, first of all, you need a certain amount of uh, wave action, significant amount, not the very calm seas that doesn't work. Most of the equatorial seas tend to be relatively calmer and the, uh, in terms of the ROI calculation, the further you go away from the equator, you get more uh, wave action in terms of turbulence and various other other activities you know the, the tidal action is stronger the wave action is stronger uh, Scotland has plenty of research and a lot of projects actually pilots that are working generating power so, Himanshu is going to take you to a different topic because sometimes when these things happen you reach what I call diminishing returns okay uh, and I think we've reached the diminishing return on this topic but I'll leave you with one thought because it's raised a very good point. Why don't we do wave or tidal? And I think these, these pockets of energy, they're all technically relevant, but they're only applicable in certain areas. Solar and wind happen to be two that are relevant almost everywhere in the world. Okay. So I think this is what's happening. It's a matter of economy, economy of scale also. Uh, so uh, solar, for example, it wasn't that long ago. It was pretty, pretty expensive. I mean, right now in India, you can do solar, you can produce solar for about one and a half rupees a unit, okay? I mean, it used to be seven, eight, fifteen, okay? So, what it takes is scale, okay? And I won't go into why solar came down. It came down due to the government policy of one of the European governments, and we won't go there because you don't want to know about it. But the point is, scale brings costs down. It's going to get difficult to do scale on tides and waves because they are so niche place. They're great where they work. But yeah, you going to say something? No. Okay. Then let's move to the next topic. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. Satya. No, I think, I think Tidal, the, the problem is uh, simple, right? So, um, yeah, the tech already exists, obviously not at the cost levels that it needs to uh, make sense. Uh, probably still at uh, 14, 15, same with solar, right, when it started, right? Um, now, after you produce the energy, what do you do with it? You need to transport it and connect it to some grid, uh, right? Which grid uh, would you want to connect it to? And who's going to pay for that energy that's being produced? Somebody has to invest in that capex, and somebody else has to pay in an OPEX manner, right? That's the part that needs to be worked out, right? And somebody has to bite the bullet and do it. I think Scotland, as you mentioned, is starting to 
scale that, right? Then there will be one Bakra who will, who will take it up and scale it like Germany did a while ago. And then there will be one manufacturing Bakra like China who will ramp up like mad. Probably same thing will happen uh, to that. And, and eventually India will adopt that lowest cost option. Because India will not touch anything that is uh, not below or equivalent to solar or wind at this point from a volume standpoint. Hope that makes sense. Thanks, thanks Max for concluding it. So before we move to the next topic, one last thought and uh, maybe we can discuss a little bit about it. So uh, we talk a lot about electric vehicles, but when we say electric vehicles, we sometimes don't consider how are we going to run our ships and passenger planes and jet planes on electric uh, batteries? Is it possible? Or will we have to replace uh, petrol and diesel with some other types of uh, energy dense liquid fuel? Somebody want to share some thoughts on it? Yes, sir. Very quickly. Uh, so for the short range uh, and then high power vehicles like cars and two wheelers, I think the batteries are good. But especially the trucks and heavy equipments, I strongly believe, I'm going back to my topic, hydrogen, compressed hydrogen, I think that's, it's a, it's a high energy uh, dense system. I think uh, that's going to be the future, I guess. Because we cannot transport like several tons of, you know, essentially every vehicle is going to be submarine. If you're going to uh, make everything, uh, like if you run a ship by battery, uh, submarines are run by batteries, apparently, now red acid batteries. So every vehicle has to be thought of in the same process. Uh, every, I mean, ship, um, uh, marine vehicles will have to be thought of in the same process, which is going to be fairly difficult and expensive. So we'll have to go to hydrogen. Okay, so we have one uh, option. We can uh, do the small vehicles with batteries, but whenever we have a large vehicle like ships and all, we can use hydrogen. Anyone else want to comment on it? Is hydrogen the solution for large vehicles? Or maybe we can generate uh, liquid fuels from biomass? Or something? Safe? Fine. If it is safe, then it's fine. Okay. Fine. So, okay. so there's another uh, part of this discussion. Today's discussion is uh, Atma Nirbhar Bharat. So we keep hearing this term again and again, Atma Nirbhar Bharat, Make in India. So we just want to uh, make sure what all of you think when this term, when you hear this term, Atma Nirbhar Bharat. Can somebody want to start and uh, share the thoughts? What, what do you understand? What comes to your mind when we say we are going to be Atma Nirbhar Bharat? We can keep the discussion ready to energy. Yes, Priti, please. I think, yeah, I think I'm good now. Good. Uh, Atma Nirbhar Bharat to me means, first of all, being able to operate my own mic. Um, but also, I think it's a certain pride in our ability to uh, do things for ourselves, by ourselves, including for energy. For ourselves, by ourselves. Any other thoughts? A lot of rhetoric. There's no meaning. Well, I'm not saying that, but I think you got to be a bit realistic. Um, if you want to go Atma Nirbhar, many times you will end up trying to reinvent the wheel. I think the smart thing is to pick up uh, smart ideas from elsewhere and uh, try to do what you're really good at. And if you're going to say, look, I don't want lithium to come from Bolivia, then you have to go try to hunt for lithium somewhere in India. I don't know if it's available. Then, I don't know, I mean, I think we got to be a bit realistic, so. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say I don't know, I'm saying there has to be a boundary around Atma Nirbhar, and then if you start drawing boundaries, different people draw different boundaries, and so which why I'm saying it's, it's, it's okay, it's nice to have a philosophy like that, but you got to be a bit more realistic. Vasu. No. Yeah, I, I support Dr. Preeti there because that's not what it's supposed to say. As even uh, yesterday, uh, we had uh, Dr. Uh, uh, one of the keynote speakers, uh, Vijay Raghavan, right? He, he was talking about that. He said that is not about manufacturing everything in India. That's not about do, trying to do everything by ourselves. But becoming independent enough that we are able to meet our needs in a uh, sustainable and profitable manner. That's how some of the, this. that's a good point what you're raising because a lot of 
understanding has been like, okay, we have to do everything by ourselves. But at least this is how I have understood it. So, uh, and you see, as I said, nobody is doubting the fact that it will be nice to be self-reliant. When it comes to a renewable energy thing, today the fact is that you got to be dependent on the rest of the world to make sure that you grow fast. Otherwise, you got to reinvent the wheel or try to do something completely different for storage. It could take forever. No, I okay. think. Uh, let me. Can I counter? So okay. basically, two years ago, we did not had SII and we did not had uh, uh, Bharat Biotech. So we have all vaccinated now. So if you think we cannot do it in India, then who can else? I mean, 130 people, 130 billion vaccinations in India, and that is a five years ago. We never even dreamed of that vaccination amount available in India. True. That is what we are saying. So if we can do it in vaccination, which is which, which was supposed to be a European or a US technology, then we can do everything. I mean, if you don't count the numbers, then what else? Okay. Professor okay. Agu, so I, can you, can you so build on the actual topic? Yeah. Okay. Thomas Friedman yeah. says, uh, it's, it's wrong. Thomas Friedman says, the world is flat, right? And suddenly you walk. Okay, so I think uh, just like hydrogen, I think uh, self-reliance also is very abused, right? I think you should give colors to self-reliance. Self-reliance does not mean I'll do everything, everything will be in India. I think a broader interpretation is, so look at what is happening in the US because they are dependent so much on the supply chain from China, right? So self-reliant in my mind means that uh, you have a good supply chain that whatever happens, you can still have enough to survive. That is the broader concept of self-reliance. I don't think self-reliance means I'll do everything, I'll reinvent everything, I will suddenly start growing lithium in India. It's not possible, right? So I think it's more about the supply chain and being uh, not so dependent on the world while being dependent. So that is a very nuanced concept. I just uh, think we should think about that carefully. Okay, so let's build on that. Let's build on that in the following way. Let's build on the lithium point, okay? Uh, he's correct. Uh, we can't do without lithium ion batteries. We can't do without importing lithium. But how could it become self-reliant? Okay. There is a way. Yes. Okay. We are talking about... Are going to build on that point? You're going to answer okay. it? Yeah, we are talking about EV vehicles in India. EV, EV. EV, EV, yes. So the main part, one of the main part is BLDC motor. BLD motor. motor, BLDC motor, oh, permanent magnet. Okay, okay yes. Oh, so the, now this 80 percent of uh, the ore is coming from China. How can you be? How can you get? Nobody makes BLDC motor in India. They are all importing magnet. They are uh, screwdriver technology. They are doing. You know, throughout the world, it is impossible to be self and this kind of thing. Yes, what's your mind? Great point, but that again goes back to Atmanirbhar. If you look at the number of alternate technologies, I can tell you the number of companies which are working on non uh, motors which do not need permanent magnets. So those kind of, the, I mean, it's part of Atmanirbhar or whatever, you know, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, by the way, I'm not a, a you know, very well-versed Hindi guy. So, um, so yes, there are multiple solutions including, um, you know, the different kind of, uh, what's that motor called, which is, uh, yeah, 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 SR, SRM, SRMs, yes, correct, switch reluctance, exactly. So, so let's build on that so, point. So this yeah. is an ex ex excellent example that at the moment we need permanent magnets. At the moment we're using rare earth metals to do this near dimium and so forth. So it, it begs the question, what could India do about that? How, what could we do domestically to come out from under that problem that today it's all coming from China? Yeah, some. Give, give the person a mic. Yeah. Uh, take this one. Hello? Yeah, so as then mentioned, two points about yeah, lithium. The as the, there are two points mentioned here about lithium ion ore and the motors. So motors we have, switch so reluctance motors that have been invested and researched in India, which are completely non, 
rare magnet based and again the supply chain part that not so much uh, affect the supply chain when your major commodity major linode is affected but same thing how can we be self reliant with lithium ion batteries when the main source lithium ion is not in our control if tomorrow china or anyone stops or says that we will um, uh, put more duty on import then how will we have a sustainable energy source energy storage in india okay so let's build on the point he is saying how can we re rely on import of lithium by the way lithium is not coming from china it coming from south america but it doesn't matter it coming from somewhere and if we continue to import lithium we create a saudi arabia of lithium okay everyone knows that so, so how can we address that who is we, that we need we need a blessed strategy what i call as beyond lithium energy storage strategy we need to work on anything and everything that blesses us okay so that is one uh, opinion okay he is saying have a strategy to get out from under lithium and there's two ways to do that yes very good uh, as far as i know um, we are now looking at aluminum air batteries zinc air batteries and compared to lithium these are more abundant so these are cheaper alternatives to look forward to uh, in battery segment i am not really sure about the motors okay so what she said and you couldn't hear properly because the mic was a little defective is that is she going to alternative chemistry is what she's saying you know go away from lithium ion not necessarily go away go towards alternative chemistry okay that is cool we have research going that going on that in itm what else could we do or oh, let me I, I, i'm going to pose the question differently if we stick with lithium is is there a solution other than just importing lithium all the time that is by the way but i'd want somebody else to say it yeah so no technology is com this one as a problem uh, great thanks so essentially almost every country is reliant on something for every technology so i think that that has to be ruled out i think there is no such thing called we can have everything in the country and develop something let me come to the lithium ion batteries only we don't know how to make the cell i think that's a technology developed elsewhere and we are buying the cells but from the cell to the pack level is something india can master i think we really have technologies and we really have expertise to do that i think there's something we never talk about we know how to do the thermal cooling of the batteries while charging discharging and then the charging uh, ports that has to be generated across the we, we know how to make transformers i think india is very good at it and i think that's the area we need to focus on we should not think of importing all the charges from elsewhere abroad and then install it in india and call it as it's uh, it to fit something that we have done it ourselves but rather these are the areas we need to focus on let's not focus even on the cell level i'm going to work up okay. cell to pack and then pack to charging thermal cooling needs to be considered so let's build on that point in fact i specifically i'd go back to lithium in a second but let's build on this point on charging the most effective electric vehicles are going to happen when we go to what's called level 3 charging and level 3 charging is for 40 volts and you can charge most vehicles in 15 minutes okay that's when people start wanting to really use it but to do that we need high band gap semiconductors and right now we don't make that here but can we make it here absolutely so that's an excellent example of that this is not what we're doing now you're getting something from the west but you don't have to keep doing that okay so let's park that one and or unless someone has any comment on that on the, on the issue of chargers and how to become self sufficient on chargers pity it's you it's not the mic i know it's me just a quick uh, rejoinder do we need that 15 minute charging is that a goal relevant for us i love the question okay so now the kinds of expectations that the west is putting on themselves do they apply to us okay it is an example in the talk last night kartik said that what the west says is that vegetables should be transported between 2 and 8 degrees centigrade and he told you how if you were there how difficult that was how costly that was and how difficult was to warehouse those things okay and then he discovered that that was to the west because they need to keep it for 7 to 10 days here within 2 to 3 days of production it gets consumed we have a different economy so he said i don't have to do 8 degrees c i can much higher temperature i can do air conditioning temperatures 
like that the cost came down. So it's an excellent example. So, you, so Peter is a good point. Sorry, Professor Preeti, I'm sorry, you know, let it go, okay, all right. It is a good point, which is that in this case, is the quick charging... It's the relevant. ride tomorrow that, to the airport that's at stake for you. <laughs> she says that she's going to take me to the airport because she wants to make sure I leave. <laughs> and she's, supposed, she's friendly, actually, so I don't know how the others would react, but anyway. Uh, so uh, let's build on that point, and the point is that we are so used to Western expectations of tech. You know, the Western expectations of how they do things set the, uh, set the standards. And so in this case, so in this case of Karthik, he said that standard is not right for me, I'm not doing it, okay? What else is there? Can we build on that point? Can we think of others? Or if you want to build on the fast charging, that's fine too. Yes, Ashok, get a mic from somewhere. <clears throat> Yeah, I wanted to build on Preeti's point, Professor Preeti's point. Uh, so this 15-minute charging thing, right? So one of the things we were discussing at Chevron in the U.S. was, where do we make our money? We make more money in the sea store when people walk in and buy Coca-Cola than the gasoline we sell and the diesel we sell. That's the truth, because the margins are very small. So the idea was, make this a 30-minute charging or a 40-minute charging. Have them go in, have a, have a Starbucks, have a cup of coffee, go shopping give them an iPad to, to play with after they watch a Chevron commercial, you know? So there's things you could do that, now, if you're in a rush, you're going to work, yes, you need rapid charging, but you can take extra time to charge if you can provide useful things for, for people to do. So that, that okay, so that's one approach Ashok is saying, that, uh, that you, well, by the way, he's pointing out something that, at least in the U.S. context, is correct, which is no, the margins of profit are not on the petrol. It's on the stuff you sell in the shop. Well, let's not go there for the moment. Okay. So, but let's go to the India scene on the 15-minute charging. I was going to go a different direction. Ask yourself how many kilometers you drive per, per day in this country versus those countries. And then ask yourself how often you're going to want to charge, and does it matter that you need charging 15 minutes? Yes. No, I think, I think that's, uh, that's the perfect uh, answer, right? So the... the the idea is you can you can get a nighttime charger uh, off peak hours that runs in off peak um, that runs throughout the night eight hour charging that fully charges your uh, vehicle um, and the other way to look at it is you have as solar ramps up how do you handle that evening peak load right you have EVs that can act as the substitute of discharging from the EV back to the grid. It's being tried out in several uh, countries already. Uh, take the school bus, for example, which is on EV. The, uh, the evening at 3.30, it gets, you know, 4 o'clock it gets done, let's say 4 to 6. That's the peak time it can start discharging back to the grid to offset some of the PV load. So we need to look at them as just like prosumers that you're talking about for the solar, the, the prosumer model has to come for the batteries as well. Uh, yeah, so when we say charging in batteries, like I would just say that, uh, we refer to electrical charging most of the time, right? And uh, uh, I would take a step back and address this, saying that we have two different types of like charging. Even in electrical charging, we can decouple, that you can take out the battery, that is called swapping. You can swap the battery and charge it in no time. Even if you want to do that, there's no need to wait for 15 minutes. You can do it in two minutes or three minutes. But the capex is high at the same time. Uh, and then you, I would, like what we work on, we work on uh, finding a between path of this. We, we work on batteries that are, those are called Lego type batteries, or you can say mechanically charged batteries. And then what we do is we take out the active, active material within two minutes. And again, I'm not saying this is the best option. There are multiple options to it. But whatever uh, like was posted, like why 15 minutes charging? And is it like when we say 15 minutes charging, is it required for? Uh, I'm not giving any solutions. I'm just asking questions. Are, is it re required for stationary storage? Is it required for electric vehicles? What kind of application? We look into every perspective from the same lens. Uh, uh, I think we should look into more options. There are so many options out there, and that is what we. Just to build on what he, what he just said, right? The swappable batteries, right? Uh, and that, I mean, there's, there's several companies. Yeah, so basically you go to the uh, shop 
You take your old battery, put it there, build, take a new battery and go walk away. Uh, yeah, a recharged battery, right? So, so that's, the, that's the idea, right? So the, 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 and, then, and then you're looking at the 15-minute culture. Why that 15-minute culture exists? Because of the petrol you know, infrastructure. That's already built. They want it in the same shop, like he pointed out, they want to sell something else, like an EV charging solution, right? Where they can sell their Coke. Right? So instead of looking at it as a you know solution for a problem, right? Uh, I mean, uh, you sh you, uh, the, the point that he made about uh, one is the the 15 minute charging or the swap swappable batteries. The other uh, the other way to look at it is you know adopt where uh, what people need, right? In the case of a, a average disorganized guy who's used to going to the petrol bunk whenever it's going to be empty, right? They're used to that culture of just, okay, it's going to die down, let me go get this thing. So you provide a swappable option for that, right? Is in a, in a four-wheeler, is such, a, such an option exists? Not right now, I know there's, the, there's a few companies that are starting to look at it, but for two-wheelers, yes, definitely it's starting to come up in a big way. And, uh, you know, several of the newer vehicles that are coming up have a swappable option as well. I believe that 15 minutes charging or a two minutes, uh, two minute of battery swapping, everything is about a behavioral pattern. And most of the thing is basically accepted myth that faster we get, the better we can utilize the time. But it's nothing all about, it's all about people's mentality. And I, I believe that India has gone through a lot of transition in accepting new technologies and new behavioral patterns. I believe it's all about uh, how we can bring it into practice. If we say that 45 minutes charging is good for your battery life, people will accept it. Because all they accept is proof, facts and figures. And India has mostly been under the shadow of Western or Middle Eastern countries' practices. So what I am trying to say is, is basically a accepted myth or behavioral change that needs to be done. 15 minutes charge or a battery swapping, it's all about behavior. That's it. So it's uh, I, I, 45 minutes or 15 minutes is all about, if you explain it to people that 45 minutes is good for your battery, they will accept it. So it's not about how fast or how slow. It's all about behavior. Okay. Uh, can, hello? Can I go ahead. Uh, Ashok. Uh, oh, okay. So the thing is, there is something called cycling. You cannot charge the... Uh, can, I, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. You cannot charge battery 10,000 10, times or 20, 1 lakh times. So, there is a... So, there is a... What is the probability that you get a good battery when you replace? So, people are afraid of... I don't... I don't like... want to buy my, take my new car, which has got new battery, to be exchanged to some, some old battery. So, what is... There is no guarantee. That is a very, very important point. point. So, so people are not interested. So that's, a, that's a business model innovation, uh, Chidan, so the sir. guarantee also is not there if the petrol that you're filling is petrol or kerosene. No, it is. It's no, no, no. You, see, whether you're filling petrol or kerosene, that, that guarantee is also not there. I mean, if you go to a rural area, you don't know what you're filling. No, see, is. sir. Don't talk to each, each other. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, just revisiting the 15 minutes charging. So, I don't... Sorry, Yeah. Just press it again, that's all. The mic needs a 15 minutes charging. No, no, no. Hello. Yeah, the 15 minutes charging, I don't think it's something like a Western concept or something. Because a 15 minutes charging is required if you have to reduce the amount of energy storage in a vehicle. That is important if you have to have a mass scale implementation. If you do not have a fast charging, that, that becomes an important factor of increasing the storage capacity, which increases the cost, the capex cost of implementation of EV. So faster charging, slow battery capacity, more implement, more faster implementation. Okay, that's an interesting. Let's build on that point, but let's uh, we will build on that point. But yes. We don't know. No, I just want to set the stage a little bit. We're a little bit all over the place. Yes, you can do battery swapping. Yes, you can charge at night. All that's true. Uh, the, Tesla has the most number of charging stations in the U.S. They are not in petrol stations. Okay? They cover the landscape of the United States. That's, that's one way to do it. All we are talking about is in the case where there are charging stations in petrol stations, like IOC and BPC and HPC are building, 
In those cases, I'm used to sitting in the car, you go in there, in one minute, you can put 2,000 rupees worth of petrol and you drive off. In that instance, if what that gentleman said is true and you've got to sit there for 15 minutes, what do you do? So I just want to narrow the focus on that 15-minute discussion to that aspect. There could be other charging stations where it's not in a petrol station, right? Or you could, you could swap, you could do all sorts of other things. So I just want to be sure we are clear about when that 15-minute issue comes along. Okay. One, one, uh, uh, so, there are two things to build on. Uh, you have something? Yeah. Go ahead. So, I think we should look at what we are using the car for. Let's say if it's for a taxi, it would need a 15 minute charge sort of thing. And if it's a normal I mean, person is using it, it might not really require it. Because I remember reading a statistic that in US, people go for a one go long range travel. So, that would require in US 15 minute charging because if they go for 800 miles or something, then they need quick charging in between. But in India, I read a statistic that people more rarely travel more than 200 kilometers or 300 kilometers. So in that case, we might not really require 15-minute uh, charging or sort of, sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, so he, he's made the point that, we'll get back to your point because it's valid. Uh, well, all points are valid, actually, uh, uh, until they're shown not to be. Uh, that our behavior uh, does not require uh, 15 minute charging necessarily because we don't drive a lot of kilometers per day. Okay, that's right. So, but I think that gentleman's point was that if you had fast charging, you could reduce the capacity, the size, the number of kilowatt hours, okay, uh, in, the, in the battery pack. Okay, uh, that's a good point because uh, automotive companies selling cars and they want to sell cars at a broad market. They can't sell to Jews who are only 20 kilometers a day. They have to sell to others. So it's a, it's a valid point that we put into it. The only thing is this. If, if you did decide that for the India context, the fast charging was not as necessary, then all of a sudden you don't need to do the high-tech manufacture of wideband gap semiconductors in this country. That, that was the only point. It's only a discussion point, not what to do. Yo. Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, I want to contradict point, um, if you're going to limit fast charges, adoption is also going to be limited because uh, that I only do uh, in the city. When I want to drive that 200, an investment that I'm making, so I don't want to be constrained with that investment as an electric car. So definitely I want the fast charger. And yes, definitely for the 15 minutes, uh, right now it's actually one and a half hours, it's not 15 minutes. Any so the uh, that's uh, not accurate. Level three charges, uh, 440 volts. With anyway, it can be very fast. Anyway, let's not uh, argue about not that. available. No, they are available here. Yes. No. no. Yeah. No. Yeah. Not so uh, I'm I'm talking about what's available. It's yeah. one and a half hours. So I yeah. need something to do for one and a half hours. I don't want to be stranded in that place. Agree. Yeah, uh, see, the, the other point about the swappable uh, that I want to elaborate is what uh, Chitan sir said, right? It's about, uh, you know, I don't want to get my battery, good battery, new battery to get swapped to this thing. So the model is as follows. It's a business model innovation more than a tech innovation. You take, a, buy an EV without the battery. Cost comes down to 30% of the current EV costs, right? And you keep swapping your battery. Battery is not yours, you're renting the battery. That's the model that's being evaluated now, and it's being proliferated uh, for the two-wheelers, right? And, uh, and, and it's coming for the, uh, for the four-wheelers as well. Three-wheelers, it's already been done by uh, uh, Sun Mobility. The company called Sun Mobility is doing that in a big way, right? Uh, the, the other point, uh, you know, the long drive versus the short drive, right? So obviously, for the long drive, the right vehicle choice, that's why four-wheelers are taking time to come. Right. Uh, right now, the push is for two-wheelers. First, started with three-wheeler, going to two-wheelers, then to the larger buses. It makes a lot more sense to, you know, cut that, uh, you know, urban, high-paid uh, people, their, uh, you know, SSG, the, the, the uh, greenhouse, GHG uh, emissions from the high net worth individuals, because that's at 10 or above you know, tons per, uh, you know, uh, per individual, which is very high. We need to get that down to four. And that's why EV is starting to make more and more. Sense. So what he's talking about uh, is battery swapping. It's a business model. Uh, it's a model which says you will never own the battery. When you buy the car or vehicle, uh, 
you buy it without the battery and you pay only a, 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 a basically a OPEX, an operating cost that when you go into a station, they'll swap that battery for a complete, for a full one. It's a different business model. It's one that Ashok Jinjinwala suggested when he was in Delhi. Uh, it's being operated for two wheelers, as he says, and easily for three. And what his point is that you can keep escalating that, do two now, three wheelers, and then two the cars. His main point is that you're swapping uh, capital expense for operating expense. Because you never, because, because the typical, do the arithmetic, the typical battery's cost is, oh, I don't know, 20% at least of the total cost of the vehicle. Uh, and if you take that out, vehicles will sell better. That's his point. Uh, so one other point I wanted to make on the new type of battery thing is just one point. They're very careful about one thing. Even lithium ion was prohibitively expensive 10 years ago. Okay, it was about $1,000 per kilowatt hour. Now it is down to almost 100. So anything new that is done is going to take a lot of time and scale to get down to economic numbers. So I just wanted to make that point. Any, we have about three minutes left. So who, yes, you have a mic? Uh, okay. uh, yeah, so uh, when you said that uh, battery swapping is only a bit business model, I don't agree <laughs> to that. Uh, just because uh, as of now we don't understand the battery chemistry is uh, especially well saying that if I say what is end of life of a battery, what is the SOC of the battery, when you put a battery in, it's the same battery you are going to get in. Uh, so just saying, I just want to say this, that just saying that it's a business model, it is not. We have to work out the technology also, understand the fundamentals, chemistry, do a lot of rigorous testing and then come up with a business model. I just wanted to somewhat bring back to the chemistry part and say lithium, yes, it's prohibitively, was expensive, now it's much cheaper. So sodium, graphene, there's just so much to do in terms of just moving out of the lithium thinking itself. That innovation has to start, it, it has already started, it's pretty much in the academic, uh, I would say, fringes right now, but it can come to the mainstream very soon. And Hopefully, either in the battery side on the, or the capacitor, supercapacitor side, it can come. We don't have to be having this uh, affection for lithium because the cost has already come down. So we don't have to you know, relax on that sense. So I just think going back to the drawing board, going to the science of it and saying, okay, sodium also, same alkali group metal, how can we disperse it on a graphene or something like that, which can bring it to the, yes, it will be expensive in the beginning, but Hopefully, the technology will evolve. That's something I want to add. Yes, certainly. Do you have a mic? Yeah, you do. Have a good one. Great. I think the last piece of the puzzle for this uh, fast charging is we never talk about is safety. You're going to do a lot of plating on the negative electrode when you do the fast charging, and you're going to kill the battery very, very soon, and we're going to see a lot of battery explosions. I think that we never talk about, including Tesla, Porsche, BMW, everyone exploded their cars. Exploded during charging, rest, accident, every time. And we talk only about Tesla is making beautiful vehicles, but we never talked about they also exploded. And in India, you want low cost, you don't want all the safety, you want all the safety components incorporated into it, you want fast charging, you want to drive several hundred kilometers, it's not going to happen. During the transition, we will have to go through this rubble and we also have to be very careful. I think everyone have to take that small portion of uh, like disturbance when you're do, doing this transition. I think we cannot have all the comfort that petroleum has given because our grandparents, our parents, I think uh, they, they really struggled through this era of uh, before this BS norms came in for pollution. You cannot stand behind RX100 even now. It, 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 there's so, so, so much of smoke coming out. I think it evolved over time. We are comparing a system which evolved over 100 years to a system which is just 10 years old. Okay, uh, last comment. We have one minute, and that's all you got, Raghu. <laughs> See, I did the same thing yesterday also. Right? <laughs> so, so I want to leave with one different thought, right? So, Atma Nirbhar, coming back to that. I think uh, not so, doing for ourselves, but I think it's more broadly thinking for ourselves, which is what we are not doing. I think you can, all of this under a Western or a different you know, paradigm, you say I'll become Atma Nirbhar in that paradigm. But unfortunately, you have to first question the paradigm. 
and think for yourself. That is the first Atma Nirbhar. And then other things will follow. That's, that's something I think we do very poorly in our country. I think that about sums it up and we are done.